Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Paul Moore. Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, Robert. It's great to be here. Before we dive into the details of your strategy and some of your deals, I want to cover what exactly your strategy is. We talk a lot about residential real estate investing here on the show. So I want to make sure everyone listening has a clear understanding from a high level before we dive in. So Paul, yeah. tell us exactly what self-storage investing is and give us a brief history of the asset class. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so self-storage, it surprised me. You know, we see self-storage facilities everywhere. And I think, you know, later we should probably talk about the question of, are, is it oversupplied? But, uh, you know, it's not that way around the world. Uh, I believe 95 or 99% of self-storage, last I checked, is in the U.S. and Canada. And so um, self-storage is, a, you know, an asset class that people haven't thought much about. It started in the late 60s uh, in the oil fields of Texas. Some guy set up a, I think it was the AAAA111 self-storage easy store, store your stuff shed or something. I, I literally, it was that crazy. And um, anyway, it just grew over the years. It started a little, you know, slow in the seventies and then it took off in the eighties and nineties. And of course now, like I said, you see them everywhere. Uh, it's an asset class that it was largely overlooked for years, but uh, has obviously become quite popular in the last several years. And uh, a lot of uh, folks who had never thought of self-storage before are eager to invest. And uh, so when I wrote the book on it, you know, honestly, it was delayed from COVID and everything. It couldn't have been better timed because the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and a lot of other folks have said, this is the best performing commercial real estate asset class since COVID. How long have you been in the business for? Yeah. So just a super quick, I mean, history, I was in resident, I sold my company to a public firm in 97. I know I don't look that old. Thank you. But uh, seriously, now I look older than that. Right. But anyway, uh, I sold my company and I started flipping houses and I did some uh, rent to own. Then I built some houses, did a small subdivision, started flipping lots at you know Smith Mountain Lake in uh, uh, Virginia. And I always wondered how to get into commercial. I wasn't sure. And I, I invested in an oil and gas deal in 2010 in the Bakken in North Dakota. And then we realized there was this massive housing shortage. And so we um, built a couple multifamily facilities that we ran as extended stay hotels for oil workers. We made a ton of money doing that. And I ended up staying in, uh, into, uh, in multifamily. I ended up writing a book called The Perfect Investment about multifamily investing. But I concluded over the last five or six years that, you know, the perfect investment's not perfect if you can't find deals that pencil out. And it just wasn't working for me. And so we decided to expand into self-storage and mobile home parks in uh, 2018 the problem was my company didn't have any experience in that. We didn't have a team. We didn't have a track record, but we had a lot of hungry investors who were wanting to invest. So we took a third party approach. We decided to become their due, our investors' due diligence partner and go out. We, we decided to go out and look for the best operators we could find, the best deals we could locate. And we eventually put those together in a fund. And now we're on our fifth fund investors invest with us and they get diversification across self-storage, mobile home parks, uh, apartments, um, light industrial. And uh, the goal is to give them diversification across different, these asset types, geographies, operators, strategies, and of course, the deals themselves. And so that's what we do. I am not a self-storage operator, but I was so passionate about the business and you know the lack of good stuff, material out there, I started writing about it. When you sold your business in the 90s, was it a real estate firm that you sold to another public or was it a different type of business? No, it was actually a staffing firm based in Detroit. How did you get into that business? Yeah. So I, was, uh, I had an MBA and an engineering degree and um, I went to Ford Motor Company for about five years and a friend of mine at Ford uh, and I were, were honestly a little bored with corporate America. We were itching to do something entrepreneurial. And we saw this 
opportunity in what was called and what is called the PEO business, professional employer organization. And so that's a business that provides outsourced HR, payroll, and administration for lots of small companies. And so we did that. And um, after about five years, it turned out that Wall Street was just really interested in this business. Uh, and so a lot of firms went public in the late 90s, and one of them acquired us. Very interesting. So getting back to self-storage, you mentioned it's a pretty popular one today. Why is that? Why did it become so hot over the last year, two years, three years or so? Yeah, it's been hot for a while. Um, but what's caused a recent spike is, so, I mean, like everybody, two years ago, you know, next month, February, March of 2020, we were all wondering if the world was going to end or if we were all going to die or what was going to happen. Um, but self-storage got a, the first bump actually when college students started putting their stuff in storage, wondering, am I coming back in two weeks when this curve gets flattened or is it the end of the semester or is it next year? I don't know. So they put their stuff in self-storage that helped a bit. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, um, the situation unfolded and, you know, there was these four D's, um, Self-storage is recession resistant. One of the reasons is it does great in boom times because people are buying extra stuff, but in bad times, people are actually doing these four D's and the D's are downsizing, dislocation, death, and divorce. And unfortunately, there's been a good bit of that happening in general in COVID. I mean, think about dislocation alone. Lots of people are moving out of New York City and Chicago and San Francisco and LA, and they're moving to other places. They realize they can work from home. So when they did, you know, when they relocate, they're using self storage along the way. Typically, uh, those office spaces are downsizing. My friend uh, manages a ton of office space around DC, and he said people are breaking their leases left and right. Well, that office furniture and you know equipment is often going into self storage. Bars and restaurants have been closing down and that stuff's going into self-storage. And so self-storage has just boomed, like I said, since COVID. Um, but there's a lot of reasons it's boomed in general. Um, like I said, it's recession resistant. That, that doesn't mean it's recession proof, of course. Uh, the rents are inelastic. We love that. I mean, think about it. If I'm renting a $1,000 a month apartment and my landlord raises the rent by 6%, yeah, I might think twice before I sign up for that 60 bucks a month, 720 a year. But if I'm renting a self-storage unit and the landlord raises the rent by 6%, well, if I'm paying 100 bucks a month and now it's going up by 6 bucks, I'm probably not going to spend a weekend, get a U-Haul, get my friends together to move my treasures down the street just to save six bucks a month. And that's part of the point. People aren't thinking about this much. It's automatically hitting their credit card and they're thinking, eh, it's a month to month lease. When I get a long weekend, I'm going to move all that stuff out anyway. Well, they often don't do that. We've talked to people who have forgotten they had stuff in storage for literally up to seven years. And so this is, you know, it's a small part of people's income. And it is, you know, there's a huge switching cost. I mean, to move all your stuff down the street or move it into your garage or whatever, it's just, it's a bigger cost than it's worth at times like this. The, the industry is quite large. I mean, there's actually 53,000 self-storage facilities in the U.S. That's about the same as uh, Subway, Starbucks, McDonald's combined, but about 75% or so are independent operators and two out of every three of those are mom and pops. And so this prevent, you know, this provides a great opportunity for people to come in for a professional operator to come in and really, you know, pay them what's top dollar for what they have, but actually to reconfigure the facility to, you know, make it into a first class facility. And with the power of a dollar that, you know, the power of self, the power of commercial real estate value formula, it can really drive up the value and increase investor returns to a level that, you know, I haven't seen in many other asset types for a long time. 
What are the 12 characteristics that you look for to identify a facility that is owned by a mom and pop? You just mentioned there's over 70% owned by independent operators. So if somebody's looking yeah. to buy from them, what, what characteristics, what are the 12 common characteristics to look for? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so my book lays this out. We, we love this. this uh, Self-storage and mobile home parks have more mom and pop operators than any asset type I've seen, uh, any large commercial asset type at least. And so uh, these mom and pop operators, you know, they, they typically don't have the desire or the knowledge or the resources to improve their facility. Hey, they don't need to, Robert, because they've already doubled the value of their facility just from cap rate compression over the last decade. And so what that means to them is, hey, I can continue to be doing just what I'm doing, be mediocre, and I can still get great, you know, a great value for my facility. They know the value because they're getting offers all the time. But some of these characteristics include, you know, the attitude, if you build it, they will come. You remember that old movie from Kevin with Kevin Costner? Well, it used to be if you just build a self-storage facility in a decent location, it would fill up. That was before, you know, internet marketing and all kinds of crafty techniques were developed by other storage operators. But these folks, they're already fill, they're already filled up and they're typically not <clears throat> tracking um, the current rates in the market. So that's another aspect of this. They're, they rarely increase rates which means they typically stay full. The tenants are sticky. And so they don't care about raising rates. And they basically are saying, hey, look, I've, I've talked to some of these storage facility owners and they're like, hey, I'm 100% full. Why do I need to advertise? And poor advertising is another aspect of a mom and pop. They typically keep their, I, I talked to one the other day, literally he said, yeah, I've had four rate increases in 28 years. I said, what? Seriously? Oh, I mean, oh, okay, great. You want to sell? Anyway, um, but you know, they typically have no showroom. They don't sell retail items. Uh, they don't do U-Haul or Penske. They don't provide rental, uh, rental trucks, which is a really nice value add to a self-storage. Um, they, they put their pricing right across the board. In other words, they, they don't do like hotels and airlines that a great operator will actually, you know, they'll, they might move their prices differently on a Saturday versus a Tuesday afternoon. And if somebody's relocating, they might get a, a different price than somebody who's just doing this shopping out of convenience. Uh, they have poor maintenance, poor security. Uh, I know my, the one I stored in had poor pest control and had water infiltration. Um, there's no marketing budget often no website. And here's a big one. They often have untapped land. What I mean by that is they'll say, oh yeah, we, yeah, we got six extra acres here. We don't use. Oh, well with the current situation, Robert, that's another reason self-storage is so popular right now. There's a huge demand for boat and RV storage. Uh, and, um, man, self-storage facilities that have extra land and aren't using it are leaving a golden opportunity on the table. And so this is a great opportunity for someone to move in and capitalize on that. One of the assets that I've been getting into over the last year or so has been actually RV rentals. So I buy RVs and, and then rent them out similar to an Airbnb yes. model, but with, with RVs and people keep asking me like, what, what is the future of that? What are you going to do with that? And I'm like, well, as a real estate investor, maybe I'll buy a lot pave it, put a self-storage facility on it, do some boat and RV storage, and then also run an RV business out of it. So what you're, what you're talking about per leads perfect into like what I'm, what I'm doing as well. Oh, that's great, Robert. That's a fabulous strategy. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear you're doing that. You mentioned cap rate compression has allowed these owners values to go up. For those who mostly operate in the residential space, don't do much with commercial and are listening to the show, Explain to us what cap rates are and then what a cap rate compression means. Yeah, I'm going to back up a little bit and just talk about the value formula for um, commercial real estate and specifically self-storage. Think about it. When I had a flip house I was going to do and I paid $115 for it in Roanoke, Virginia, um, and added, my son got involved and we really dolled it up. I mean, we did beautiful, we just made it the most beautiful house. It was a huge house. And, you know, that meant a lot of flooring, a lot of paint, a lot of lighting. 
And we ended up spending way more than we had planned. And so I'm just going to round the numbers. Let's say we had $300,000 in it. Okay. And um, let's say that this was a $200,000 neighborhood. You can guess what would happen. That's not exactly what happened, but if it was. Um, residential real estate, as we know, is based on comps. And the value is based on the neighborhood. Commercial real estate's entirely different. It's based on math. Now, your mama always told you you should be good in math, and here's why. Because the value formula is value equals the income divided by the rate of return, which is similar to the P-E ratio in stocks in a way. But the value of the asset is the net operating income, which is the net income, you know, the gross income minus all the expenses, not including the mortgage payment. That gives us the NOI, the net operating income. And that's the numerator. The denominator is the cap rate, which is the rate of return. And this is the unleveraged rate of return. The cap rate specifically is, it, it's set by the market. It's set by market sentiment. It's not something we can set. And basically it's the price, uh, excuse me, the rate of return on an asset like this, in a location like this, at a time like this, in a condition like this. And so that cap rate used to be around, let's just say 10%. People would say, yeah, it's a 10 cap, meaning that for a million dollars, you could get a hundred thousand dollar annual cash flow. Okay. Net cash flow. Now the cap rates have compressed to, let's just say for the argument here, uh, 5%. So that means since the denominator has shrunk by half, that means the value has doubled. So now it costs $2 million to get a $100,000 income stream. So $2 million, uh, divide $100,000 into that and you get 5% or the cap rate. So cap rate compression means commercial real estate is much more popular than it was before. And part of the reason is we've got 5,000 year historic low interest rates because interest rates aren't part of that formula, but they do factor into the entire picture. So when someone's getting a loan on that deal, if they can get 2.9% interest rates, which some of these you know, mobile home parks, self-storage facilities are getting, well, if the cap rate is you know, 5%, they've still got cash flow to work with. But if interest rates were 8%, well, there's no way that people would pay, you know, at a 5% cap rate, if you know what I mean. And the cap rates are local, kind of similar to how a, a mm -hmm. comp would work, right? Like you said, comps are based on the neighborhood, the area. So a cap rate is yeah. going to be local. A cap rate for California, Los Angeles is going to be different than the middle of the Midwest, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, typically in a real popular area, you know, like let's say Boston or LA, where there's some legacy real estate values that are sort of independent of the uh, math, the cap rate might be more compressed. Uh, a small town, let's say buying multi, let's say you have a hundred unit multifamily in a town of a hundred thousand, you know, one shock to that economy can really mess it up. So investors tend to be a little more wary of something like that. They might say, you know, I really don't, I really want to get an extra risk premium to invest in Lynchburg, Virginia versus LA. So I might, you know, they might be willing to go in at a six cap, 6% 6 cap rate rather than five, for example. And we're talking about cap rates compressing, but with the other very powerful piece of commercial real estate is you can also increase the numerator. So if you increase the numerator and we're talking about maybe you have a hundred units at, and you add like $20 a month, that doesn't sound like a lot per unit. You're only adding $20 a month, but on a bait, on a total, that's a lot. And that adds a significant amount of value to your property, just the way that commercial real estate is, is valued. That's absolutely right. There are so many, you know, Robert, I laughed when I first heard the term uh, value add self-storage. I thought, wait a minute, I get value add residential and single family and, and, and apartments, you know, there's light and paints, uh, you know, fixtures and the fake hardwood flooring and appliances, but self-storage, what, what is it? It's four pieces of sheet metal, some rivets, a floor and a door. How can you add value? 
Well, my friend, I can tell you there's so much value add in self stores that I never dreamed of. You just named one of them, adding units. Um, adding units is, uh, you know, a little tougher than some because, you know, you need land, you need permits, uh, you need capital, but there's some others that are pretty easy. For example, filling vacant units. Um, a lot of mom and pops, you know, I mentioned some are totally full. Some of them are half empty. And, uh, so filling vacant units is one, um, raising the rent. A lot of these rent, you know, the mom and pops rent way below market, raising the rent 10% can raise your returns by like 30%. Um, adding a paid billboard, adding a cell tower, adding a, an ATM, a propane filling station, adding U-Haul I mentioned before. Let's just take U-Haul and use our formula and put this all together. So I have a friend who has a self-storage facility in Rockledge, Florida. He gets $5,000 a month in commission from U-Haul. I know another one that we invested with in uh, v Beeville, Texas, I think gets $1,000 a month. So let's say $3,000 a month you're adding to the bottom line. And since you've already got an employee there anyway, it's not adding any CapEx, capital expense. It's not adding any labor. So let's just say all $3,000 a month from the U-Haul commissions flows to the bottom line, Robert. So that's $3,000 a month, $36,000 a year added to the bottom line. Now, to be conservative, I would say, even if that's valued at a four and a half or 5% cap rate, let's just, you know, let's just put a 6% value on it. Interest rates might go up, right? So $36,000 a year adding to the net operating income. That's what you said, adding to the numerator. Divide that by a 6% cap rate, 0 0.06. That is a $600,000 increase in value. Now let's put this in perspective. If you bought a $2 million self-storage facility and you got leverage on it, let's say you financed, uh, you financed two thirds of that, uh, you basically only have 667,000 cash in that and the rest would be debt. If you just increase the value of that facility by 600,000, the bankers don't share in that 600,000, the investors do. You just increased the value of your equity almost 100% just by signing a contract with U-Haul and setting some trucks out front and operating those. This is really powerful stuff. And that's why I love commercial real estate. That's why I love the value formula. We're talking about this in the context of self-storage, but it works in apartments too. So if you own anything over five units, if you raise your rents, $10 a month. That might not seem like a lot on a per unit basis, but if you look like you just explained, Paul, if you add that to your net out of breaking income, you'll see even on a residential property, an apartment building, a small one even, that it'll add significant value to, this is how all commercial real estate works, not just self-storage. Right. right. And I think that's the reason the Forbes 400 wealthiest people in America almost all invest in commercial real estate to protect and grow their wealth. You mentioned that mom and pops used to be able to just buy self-storage in a good location. And that would kind of be enough. They didn't have to do advertising. What do you define as a good location for self-storage? We kind of have an idea for residential real estate, but what about self-storage? What makes a good location? Yeah. So the first thing you want with a location for self-storage would be a, a location that has a lower uh, supply of self-storage than the demand would dictate. And the way to look at that is with a radius tool. So there's a, a tool out there called Radius Plus. And if you're looking at an old Sears or uh, abandoned Kmart building or an old warehouse like we invested in uh, in Haverhill, Massachusetts, north of Boston, um, we look at this Radius Plus tool first. And we try to figure out how many square feet of self-storage there are for every person in a radius. And so in a downtown location, that might be a one-mile radius. In a typical suburban location, it might be about a three-mile radius. So if that three-mile radius has 100,000 people, we want to see, like the national average would be about seven or eight square feet of self-storage for every man, woman, and child in that radius, okay? So if it was seven or 800,000 square feet of self-storage there or much more, we would think, eh, it's probably a well-supplied location. But if we find a location like that that has maybe you know two square feet of self-storage per person, 
that is a potentially great location. So that's the first thing we look for. The second, we're looking for a highly traveled road. We're looking for a vehicle count of, you know, in a bigger city might be 30, 40, 50,000 cars per day. Uh, in a smaller town, it might be 10,000 vehicles per day. We're looking for a good traffic count. Third, we're looking for good visibility. Now you might say, well, the traffic count takes care of that. It's not necessarily true because there's a facility near me, the one I mentioned raised their rates four times in 28 years. I drove by there hundreds of times for the last six years. I don't know if I ever saw the facility, just the way it was sitting back behind other buildings. I don't know if I really noticed it. So you want good visibility. The fourth factor is you want decent incomes. So you want middle income or high income areas. Uh, you definitely don't want to be in a slum. You don't want to be in a dangerous location. Even if it's near a good area, people won't want to go there to store their stuff. You know, crime is the biggest issue with self-storage. And like I said, a lot of these mom and pops don't have security, you know, security cameras and such. But people don't want to go into a bad area, even if it's only a block into this area and they're in a nicer part of town, they'll go somewhere else. How do you get your data for how many square feet of self-storage there are in an area and also the vehicle count? Is that all public information or these studies you do yourself? Yeah, I just Google v VPD vehicles per day at that address. And I can typically get that, dig a little bit more than that, perhaps. Uh, the data on um, uh, the self-storage, excuse me, the data on the square feet of self-storage per person in a radius is really nicely contained by this tool called Radius Plus. And uh, you can either get a subscription to that, or if you just want to do a one-off location, you can go in, type in the address, pay them a little bit of money, and they'll give you a full report at you know whatever radius you want. You can go anywhere from, I've seen one mile up to three, five, and even 10 miles in a really rural location. Hey everyone, Clay Fink here, host of the Millennial Investing Podcast. Today, I wanted to tell you guys about this exciting new investment tool called Titan. Titan is an investment platform that was made for everyday investors that want their money actively managed by a team of experienced analysts. With how hectic life can get at times, why not outsource your investments to the experts? They offer three equity portfolios and America's very first actively managed crypto portfolio. Since launching each portfolio, Titan has outperformed the benchmark in three of their four portfolios on an after-fee basis. They aim to grow your investments by 15% annually, and at this rate of growth, this implies your money doubling every five years. My favorite fund is their flagship fund, which invests in the highest quality large-cap growth stocks in the U.S. Join the smarter way to invest with Titan. All it takes is $100 to get started. Right now, if you sign up through our link, titan.com TIP, You'll get your first three months of investment management for zero fees. That's titan.com slash TIP for zero fees. With the potential risk of crime and you know people breaking into storage units, what is insurance? Do you just insure against that in, in addition to having a security system? How is that handled? Yeah, every tenant actually gets their own insurance. And this is another you know, value add for self-storage because, you know, they can sell tenant insurance on their stuff for let's say eight bucks a month. And the insurance company will profit share with the self-storage facility. If you're, you know, especially if you're a professional owner with a lot of locations or a large facility, you can make four or five bucks a month. And so let's, you know, I mean, let's just do the math on that. Let's say you add insurance at $5 a month. Let's say you could profit share at five bucks a month. Multiply that by 500 storage units. That's five times 500 times 12 months. That's $30,000 added to the bottom line. Well, that could pay for an additional employee or if it goes to the NOI, the net operating income, divide 30,000 divided by 0.066%. This is our value formula. You just added half a million dollars to the value of your facility. That's straight in your investors' pockets if you sell the facility. If you bought a $2 million facility and you added half a million just by adding tenant insurance, that's pretty significant. Is there a distinction between where 
these types of things you're adding are part of the business and not part of the real estate. And then it's valued differently and, and looked at differently by lenders. You know, that's a great question. And it is looked at differently potentially by the property tax assessor. You can make an argument that we have a retail business and a real estate property here, and you can try to break them out and try to make that argument with the assessor, but there's no differentiation at all between these issues when it comes to the lender. And you know, your question speaks to the bigger issue of how these uh, operators, how these owners view their facilities. Some of these folks, when I sold my company in the 90s for you know millions of dollars, I thought about buying a storage facility. I thought, oh, it's just a cash cow. It's just going to throw off cash and I'll just get a check every month. That's pretty cool. I really wish I had invested, but I would have been a mom and pop operator if I thought that way, because if I think it's just a piece of property that throws off income, I'm sorely mistaken. I'm leaving all these value adds on the table and leaving them for somebody else to come in and do and increase the profits for their investors. Why you mentioned before that you had come across somebody who might have their facility completely full. And you mentioned that they still need to advertise. What would advertising do for them in that, that capacity if they've already been completely full? Would it just allow them to increase their rates? Yeah, essentially it would allow them to increase their rates. What they should be doing is every time somebody leaves uh, for any reason, they should be considering the possibility of increasing their rates. Uh, I've heard it said often that the most profitable facilities typically have an 88 to 93% occupancy. Other people argue that it should be like 95 or 96. But if you're at 100, and especially if you're not advertising at 100, and especially if you're doing other things wrong, chances are you're leaving a lot of money on the table. So yeah, advertising allows me to bring in more people, get better tenants, higher paying tenants, and obviously make a lot more profit. I often like to talk about the downsides to an investing strategy here on the show, especially after we've spent a bit of time talking about all the good aspects of it. So what are the downsides to or the risks of investing in self-storage? How have you seen investors or even maybe yourself get burned in the self-storage sector? Yeah, I can take you to Nashville and drive you around, Robert, and show you that it is, you, you would look around and say, this is not a place I want to invest in self-storage. There's facilities everywhere, like there are in lots of towns. And uh, I can also take you south of Nashville about 15 minutes to a wealthy suburb, a couple of them, uh, Bellevue and Belmont, and show you that due to zoning, land prices, and other issues, they haven't got any facilities, last I checked at least. And so they have a huge shortfall in self-storage facilities, and there's a huge demand there for it. And so that would be a great place to build. Self-storage is very, very hyper uh, local. It's not, you don't want to just look at the market. You want to look at the sub market and even the, you know, the exact location within the sub market. The biggest risk for self-storage and therefore the biggest downside is when you're leasing up a new facility, the possibility exists that a national competitor will build nearby. And if this happens and you're only 10, 20, 30% leased up, chances are you're going to have a long, hard road to get fully occupied and stabilized. Uh, the national company can come in. They can probably outmarket you. They probably have better studies than you. They might have a better staff than you. And they can certainly lose money a lot longer than most of us. And so this is a real risk, especially in an oversupplied market like we're seeing uh, around the country right now. Um, so this is the number one risk of self-storage. I've heard it said that every well-located, well-marketed, well-staffed facility eventually fills up. But eventually, you know, that time, you know, if you've got a bridge loan, a construction loan that, you know, is basically a three-year bridge loan. That can be nail biting if two national competitors pop up nearby. And that's exactly what happened to us in one of our first self storage investments years ago. We were uh, investing in Bradenton, Florida, and we were right by um, Lakewood Ranch, which was, I believe, the first or second fastest growing master plan community in America. 
we were right in the middle of it on a main road. That felt pretty good. There was actually two facilities. One facility was almost stabilized and the other one had just built out a lot of new um, uh, units. And so it was definitely not stabilized. So the uh, operator we invested with took over. And then the first thing that happened is about 60 of the units suddenly vacated, but there was nobody there picking up their stuff. Huh? What happened? Well, it appears that the previous owner had um, padded the rent rolls to make a better economic number. You know, think about the value formulas based on the income divided by the cap rate. Well, it appears, and I'm not saying that they really did, that the owner had a lot of family members' names on the rent rolls and were padding that. So that was a, a big shock right up front. And that's an unusual risk, but it is a risk in self-storage. You know, to be need to be real careful in any real estate business, you know, doing due diligence. Well, the second shock to due diligence was two national competitors uh, were permitted and were building really close by, and they built very fast. When they came in, it made it hard for all three facilities to get to stabilization. Well, these national competitors had better staffs, better marketing. They could undercut prices, like I said, and it made it very difficult for the investment we made. And so we were expecting to get about a 4% reach cash flow the first year, six the second, seven or eight after that. We actually got a 1.8% cash flow total in the first three and a half years. And worse than that, the operator was faced with refinancing this bridge loan and he wasn't at stabilization. And there was a question about whether he would even be able to get refinanced. Well, you know, you're talking about a 75% LTV debt. This would have been disastrous for the operator and the investors. Well, he was able to get refinanced. He had a, he put a better team in he increased his marketing. He did all kinds of things. He threw a lot of effort at this facility. Eventually, uh, the net operating income, the occupancy, everything got to stabilization in the like 92% range. And he just sold the facility at a cap rate you know, somewhere in the 5% range. And uh, all the investors got their principal back plus an 80% profit in about three and a half years. So it turned out to be about, you know, mid 20% per year return. Pretty good deal overall for a real nail biting experience. Did he sell to a national competitor? You know what he did? He actually had a national company. He had offers from several national competitors. He had a big private equity group come in and take out all the investors at a better, much better offer than any of the other offers he got from the national competitors, which is kind of surprising. But this private equity group paid him much more and kept him on as the property manager. So he got to benefit twice. Interesting. So do you see national competitors as like one of your, is it on your checklist and it's an instant, I don't go there because there's so many national competitors, or is it just something that you want to be aware of and you just want to kind of make a mental note of? Yeah, we definitely want to be, you know, aware of that and make a note of it at, you know, to say the least. We invested in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, and there were some national competitors nearby, and it actually was a little overcrowded space, and that's been a little slower to get to profitability than some other areas. We also invested in Ishpeming, Michigan. I think the population there is about two or three thousand people but we have a 1500 unit self-storage facility that draws people from all over the rural areas to that area. And it's full and it's humming along. We also invested in Beeville, Texas. We invested in a mom and pop facility. The, all the owners were the five kids. The parents had passed away, sadly. The five kids were fighting and they were taking this facility into the ground. And so they wanted about $5 million for it. My operating partner paid $2.4 million for it, cash, quick closing. He went in, he put in some great marketing. He kicked out the bad tenants. He raised the rates 20 or 30%. He fixed the occupancy, um, fixed some other stuff, added U-Haul. 
And remember, we only paid 2.4 million cash. Three months later, got a $4.6 million appraisal, financed it at 43% LTV. That's $2 million financing. That means us as investors, we only had half a million dollars left in this, you know, not the 2.4 we had put in up front. And um, when he sold it for 4.6 million, uh, 18 months later, it was a huge payday for the investors. How do you combat against the, I guess I'll call it fraud that you saw with the owner having their family rent or, or supposedly rent from them. And, and we see, like you said, you see this in other asset classes too, but just what are you doing for due diligence to verify these rent rolls and make sure that the information you're getting from the seller is accurate? You know, um, we, our strategy, my company, Wellings Capital, we, our strategy is to invest with operators who are experts. And so it's sort of a Berkshire Hathaway strategy. You know, we look for the very best teams with the very best products, the best companies, and we invest heavily with them. And we, what's one of the questions we ask now, of course, we're asking them, how do you do due diligence on this? And they each have their own strategies, but you know, they just need to, you know, uh, they need to uncover everything they can by looking through the books. They need to match, you know, revenues and expenses on the books. Of course, that wouldn't have caught that one. And I think that, you know, as a result of that, after that happened, I think, Robert, if I was the one doing due diligence, I would add to my sales contract some kind of clause stating, you know, that you are certifying this rent roll. I wonder if there's a way to just not, you know, if they, it, a, a big red flag might be if they're getting a lot of people paying in cash because obviously family could quote unquote pay in cash. But if everybody's paying through an online system or through a credit card, I mean, they're probably not charging their family members every month for something that they're not actually using. Right. So I don't know, maybe that's a good way to kind of combat that. You know, I mean, that, that would be something to look at for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that reminds me, I mean, I'm, it's a little off topic, but it reminds me of one my friend was buying a self storage facility near Chicago and uh, this is another aspect of a mom and pop seller. Uh, the seller actually, I mean, okay, remember, we want people to think about us all the time as a self-storage facility before they rent and up to the day they rent and put their stuff in. Then they, we want them to forget about us, right? Well, this self-storage facility, the way they had their people pay was to bring cash in an envelope. And you would think I'm going to say, drop it at the office. No. They were supposed to slide it under the door or open their unit and put it under the door right on the right side. So the unit facility man, the facility manager would have to go around, open each unit and grab their cash or their check every month. And uh, it's just unimaginable that, that, and this is just like your quintessential mom and pop. And we love it. I was going to say that sounds about as mom and pop as it possibly gets. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if it's legal to open their units, but that's beside the point. You've mentioned staff quite a few times in, in some of your explanations. And I want to dive into that for a second because I had a, another gentleman on the show named Nick Huber, who is pretty big in the self-storage space. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but mm -hmm. what he does is, it sounds like it's a little bit different than you. It sounds like you're buying with relatively big populations. He's buying in these, at least from my understanding, is buying in these areas with very, very small populations. But what he does is he has no staff at his self-storage facilities. He's basically entirely automates it. So the gates all automated security, everything's automated. They fill out everything online. And so his kind of, that's his competitive advantage because yeah. now you're dropping 30, 40, $50,000 from expenses and that's going right to the bottom line and not net operating income significantly increases the value of his property. How do you think about staff when it comes to your self-storage facilities? And, and have you considered this kind of more automated model? Yeah. So I talk about this in the book and I didn't give it enough time in the book. Honestly, that's one of the shortfalls of my book. I think that I didn't talk about that as much as I should have. Um, this is the best time in history up to now, at least to have an automated facility. It used to be just a few years ago when people were trying to do automated facilities, they would buy this $35,000 kiosk 
that would be sitting out front and people would have to go through that kiosk. I'm sure it worked fine, but of course, stuff like that gets outdated really quickly. Well, you know, with iPhones and, you know, Android now, you can actually just punch all that in right on your phone. It's just a matter of software. It's sort of like Tesla, you know, uh, you know, took overtook the, uh, the gauges in cars. Right. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, it's a great time to automate. Now that said, you're losing a lot of value add opportunities. Let's go over a few. Number one, you can't do U-Haul from there. So that's enough, you know, U-Haul could be enough commission to pay for an employee, but, there's other stuff you can't do as well. You can't upsell them. At least you can't do it as easily as you could with a live person. Uh, you know, these live people, sometimes they'll say, hey, if for just, you know, five bucks extra a month, you could get this end unit or you could be right by the elevator or whatever. Um, another issue is um, you don't have the showroom. So you don't have the retail items. You know, you don't, you can't sell locks. You can't easily sell locks, boxes, tape and scissors to these customers. You can't rent dollies. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can't do um, if you don't have a live person there. So that's what I would say. I would say there is definitely a place for uh, his strategy. And like I said, I wish I would have covered that more. You mentioned before that self-storage is relatively recession resistant. I want to talk about that for a second. How has self-storage performed in previous recessions and how do you think it'll do in upcoming potential recessions? Yeah, Howard Marks says trees don't go to the, grow to the sky and uh, we're definitely going to have a downturn at some point. In 2008, uh, mobile home parks did better than self-storage and every other asset class. In fact, there wasn't a dip at all, but self-storage came up right behind them and they shot up right out of the 2008 recession. You, again, you had the downsizing, you know, people are downsizing from a 4,000 to a 2,000 square foot home or a 2,000 square foot home to an apartment and they need a place to store their stuff. And you've got dislocation, people losing their jobs. Um, and then, like I said, in good times, people are buying more stuff or holding on to their stuff longer and they need a place to store it. And um, <clears throat> so it really does seem like the argument is that the recession resistance of this combined with the sticky tenants. And again, that doesn't mean guys wearing Velcro suits, though I'm not here to judge them. Uh, seriously, sticky tenants are, you know, people who tend to stay because of the hassle factor and because of the relatively low price of storage. So when you combine those issues, you really have an asset class that is relatively recession resistant. Now, I didn't say recession proof, but recession resistant. COVID, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the show, has actually uh, allowed self-storage to do even better than most other, if not all other commercial real estate asset types. And of course, we don't know what we don't know about the next recession, but it seems like self-storage is well positioned to continue to do well, unless you're one of those facilities that's newly built, just leasing up right when a big you know, downturn or disaster hits and you're in a location next to some national competitors. In your book, you mentioned that you mentioned a few different paths that people can take to get into self-storage, actually to become a self-storage master. And the first one of those paths is what you call the long and winding road. What, what does this approach look like? Yeah. So um, that would be an approach where you just go out and buy a self-storage facility. Uh, you hopefully, you know, hopefully it's a mom and pop. You renovate it. You add gravel parking, you know, for boats and RVs. You, you do everything you can to make it perform as well as you can. And then you sell it and then do it again. You buy a bigger one and you renovate it, rent it up, sell it, and then you buy another one. Now, of course, you can do that with refinance, you know, the Burr method that Bigger Pockets made popular. But honestly, uh, the, um, the way I'm talking about is actually selling between uh, these facilities. And that's what we would typically see in that strategy. Why do you choose to sell instead of just refinance and take your cash out? 
Yeah. I mean, you know, when you refinance, of course, you still have some equity in the deal. And especially in these early deals, until you get an investor, uh, the, the, most, the most efficient way to get the most cash to go buy a larger facility, um, you know, technically is to sell or to get some investors to take that equity out. So you have more equity to go to the next deal. One of the other paths you have is called the baptism by fire path. And you say it's the fastest path up the steepest mountain. Walk us through this path and how it works. Yeah, that would be the path I spend the least time on the book, I think, because so few people take it. But I mean, if you made a lot of money in Bitcoin or if you retired from the NFL or won the lottery or got a big inheritance or, you know, sold your tech company, well, I covered everything, didn't I? Uh, you've got a lot of money at your disposal. You can uh, actually just go in and buy a big self-storage facility right off the bat. And this is the toughest, well, it's not the toughest way, but it is the riskiest way in the sense that you're putting out maybe $5 million of your own money, maybe less, um, right off the bat before you know anything. So to do that, you're going to want to get a great asset management team around you. You want to get great advice, and you're going to want to make sure you have a great property manager. And you're doing all that without much knowledge. So you have to typically throw a lot of cash at that. And that's why there's a lot of risk with that path. I know Nad- I know Nadamik and Sue from the NFL is big into finance and crypto and this whole kind of realm and, and even real estate that we've been talking about. So I like to I like to think he's listening to the show. So if he's listening to the show, that might be an approach that that he takes. There you go. Paul, to wrap up the show Tell us what has been the most influential book in your life, and then tell us where can people go to connect with you? All right. So I I love a lot of books, but uh, one of them for sure is The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan. There he goes. So yes, I'm glad you have that, my friend. Um, No other book has described the pitfalls of being an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial investor in my case like that one. When I was an entrepreneur, I chased shiny objects. I actually told people I should put serial entrepreneur on my business card. Well, that would have been a terrible mistake, just like chasing shiny objects was for me. I did it over and over. And a lot of those years, you know, I didn't mention uh, in my story, I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, after all, uh, I had a podcast for four years uh, called How to Lose Money. And we talked about mistakes people made along their way to the top. And so um, I interviewed 238 successful people, and uh, a lot of them did the same thing. Entrepreneurial investing is when you invest like an entrepreneur. In other words, you chase a shiny object, you speculate instead of investing. You know, investing is when your principal's safe and you got a chance to make money. Speculating is when your principal's not at all safe and you got a chance to make money. Well, I, I speculated just like I was an entrepreneur chasing shiny objects. And the one thing that book brought all that into focus and allowed me to see the many errors of my ways. That sounds like a great title for your podcast. I I think that's very catchy and and probably drew a lot of attention from people. And it's funny you mentioned the one thing because I've read it before. I read it a few years ago, but I've been really struggling with the shiny object syndrome as an entrepreneur over the last year, year and a half. And so I'm actually in the middle of reading it right now. I'm about halfway through and, and I'm really enjoying it. I really needed it. So Paul, That's thanks great. so much for coming on the show. Where can everybody pick up your book, connect with you, learn more about what you got going on? Yeah, the book's called Storing Up Profits. It's available at biggerpockets.com slash storage or on Amazon. Uh, And if they want to connect with me, they can do it at my website. It's wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, wellingscapital.com. And if you add slash resources, we'll give you a bunch of free stuff, including a uh, special report on self-storage and another course on how to get into commercial real estate if you're interested in doing that. Awesome. I will put a link to all those different resources of Paul's in the show notes for anybody that's interested in checking them out. Paul, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, it's great to be here, Robert. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. 
What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.